I will ask us to continue in the spirit. When Elder Paul led us through communion and thanksgiving concerning the flow, the river, uh, I quickly checked out my Bible to make sure I get the context right for John chapter 7. And of course, later on, it bring in John chapter 7. And I want us to, to, to be there, all right? John chapter 7 um, starts off in um, verse 37, 36, 37. It was the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus was in Jerusalem. He's standing by the pool of Shalom. And then he shouted in a loud voice. Now it being a feast, there were lots of people. The feast was to commemorate Israel supplied by water from the rock that was struck. So the priest would go to the pool of Shalom and bring water and there will be a little procession to the temple celebrating the provision of water in their journey in the wilderness. We can live without food for a few days, but we will struggle to live without water for a few days. In fact, we'll die of thirst first before we try to die out of starvation. So water is very important. What Jesus was saying is he is the fulfillment of that experience in the wilderness. In his shouting, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. This is the invitation to all of us. He who believes in me, do you believe? Right? So this is an invitation to those who believe. It's a shout. Everybody hears. Everybody surely believes God in one way or another. Otherwise, why are you found in Jerusalem in the feast? <laughs> But specifically, he says then, if he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I hear the spirit of the Lord saying, do not be a spectator. Shall I say that again? I hear the spirit of God say, do not be a spectator. Do not be a spectator of the scriptures that we read. Ezekiel's vision was a fantastic vision. It invites us to participate just like Ezekiel. And so there's a, an idea that God's speaking to us, inviting us to participate. Here Jesus invites us directly. Everyone here who believes, let us start. Out of the, your heart, this is where your belief is. This is where your, the word of God is. This is where the Holy Spirit is resident. Am I correct? This is where Jesus lives. Amen? This is where the resurrected Christ is. Hallelujah. This is where your righteousness and your justification is. Amen? Now start blessing yourself. Out of your innermost being, out of your heart, out of your belief, out of your heart that overflows comes speech. Am I correct? Let's start now. Bless yourself. Bless yourself with the very thing that you need most now. I'm going to continue speaking in tongues. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And if you have not yet received the experience of speaking in tongues, well, just carry on blessing yourself. Brian let out a prophetic word that you are not small, you are not insignificant, you are significant. You're not just a member of the church or a visitor to the church. As a believer, you are a child of God, a son, a daughter. With privileges, you sit at the right hand of Father. You are a co-heir with Christ. You have an inheritance. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing that there is. In Christ Jesus. Amen. It is Father's will that you and I be presented to Him holy and blameless through Christ. Amen. So put away all the shame. Put away all the failure. Put away all the insignificance. 
and bless yourself, says the Lord. Hallelujah. If you speak in tongues, just, just, just speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord that you may have a word of interpretation. Glory, glory, glory. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus shouted at the pool of Shalom. Those who hear him and believe, how do you think they would respond? With a whimper? We are encouraged to say yes and amen. Am I correct? That he did before the giving of the Holy Spirit. John explains this was a promise of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus was alluding to. We are in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit already resides in us. And so we cannot be silent. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Seriously, seriously, seriously. <laughs> we'll continue more next week, but speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Desire spiritual gifts. What does the word of God say? Desire spiritual gifts. Why desire? Because it is good. It's a gift from God. Amen. You want bonuses. You want blessings. You want a spouse. You want good things. Well, God has given you good things. Amen. It's a gift. When, the, when tongues are interpreted, it becomes prophecy. When prophecy comes, it gives us an understanding and a revelation of where we are and what's happening. Am I correct? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's a lot of confirmation going on. Hallelujah. And when the prophetic word is released, it is God speaking through His Spirit and things happen. Amen. In the first chapter of Genesis, the earth was dark. And it was void, but the Spirit of God hovered, waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for the Word. The Spirit of God hovers for a revival, for a move. Hallelujah. Seeking out hearts, there is reaching out to Him. Calling Him, your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen. And so we cannot be silent, can we? We cannot pray a whimpering prayer of failure and rejection and having a pity party. No. No. Even at the cross, Jesus says, forgive them, Father. They do not know what they do. He didn't have a pity party. It's, oh, kasian, kasian saya. Oh, it's so painful. I'm so thirsty. No. He knew what he was doing. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I think that is a very good precursor. Or there's a very good introduction to next week. And it's also a kind of good introduction to what I have prepared for us today. Many weeks ago, we started in Matthew 5 about the Sermon on the Mount. Right? And so slowly we went through the verses and so on and so forth. Then I think Easter came along. So there was a shift and we talked about the cross and then we talked about the resurrection and then, of course, Ascension Day was coming. And then when you talk about the resurrection and you're marching towards Pentecost, you can't ignore that. All right? So I talked about Ascension last week without, dis without describing too much about the Ascension other than to acknowledge that it was an event, but I spent more time about the preparation that Jesus did with his disciples. We all celebrate Easter. We know it's resurrection. Resurrection Sunday. I did not preach so much about so much about the resurrection, but I touch on the disciples who were confused. They heard about him rising from the dead, but there was some unbelief going on because it was like, whoever rises from the dead? And somebody would say, Did not Lazarus rise from the dead? Did not he also raise people from the dead? But but it just could not, they, they could not compute. Yeah, maybe he did that, but this is he himself. We saw him on the cross. And the Romans are very good at one thing, or many things. And one of the things is, if they put you on the cross, you die. They made doubly sure of it. There's no such thing as going to the cross and not dying. 
So there was all these difficulties. And so Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And he expounded scriptures to them, not just to Cleopas and the other, he, he, his friend or his wife who was traveling with him. By that, he also expounded the scriptures to the whole lot of them. And in the 40 days, he spoke to them about what? About the kingdom of God. Speaking to them about the kingdom of God, which I think is a little bit different from teaching about the kingdom of God. He was no longer preaching to the choir. These are disciples who already believe and now strengthened. They are restored. The confusion is corrected. Amen. The restoration is there. Thomas is restored. Peter is restored. Mary, the mother of Jesus, not that she re restored. She needs restoration of any kind. But certainly, this is her boy. That's my nickname. My pet name. My mother called me boy. I guess being the only son, I get the privilege, right? But Jesus was the eldest. He was her boy. This was the promised one. And she sang the Magnificat before he was born. And her boy hung on the cross, all bloodied and shame. How would she feel? But there were prophecies already. She kept these things in her heart, but she was strong. Amen. And finally, the fulfillment. He rose from the dead. He is the Messiah. Hallelujah. There was no mistake. Simeon did not make a mistake. Isaiah did not make a mistake. Amen. So they were all prepared. And of course, they went out to Mount Olivet. And he had to ascend. So for 40 days, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, all the details. And he gave them the great commission to people who were a few weeks ago confused, in unbelief, <laughs> who needed correction. In fact, the Bible tells us Jesus rebuked them. How can you not believe? Have I not told you so many times? Did not the scriptures say so? You've been to Bible school how many times? How many rabbis have you sat under? How is it you cannot believe? And then he, he ascended. Amen. And we're going to pick up from there. Because the next thing is Pentecost. And for us in our calendar, Pentecost is next Sunday. So can you come ready in your heart to receive something special from the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not just a move, all of us, that would be nice, but first, let it be a move starting with you. A shift starting with you. A desire a, a, and a thirst that can only be quenched by none other than the Spirit of God Himself. How about that? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's the one giving gifts. Praise the Lord. So this is where, where we are. Acts chapter 1. Let, let me just read a little bit of prologue uh, to set the ball rolling, okay? So there's, there's a context to it. We go to Acts chapter 1 and we start from verse 1 to 3. This is the Apostle Luke who wrote this. He says, The former account I made of Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's where I got the idea from, right? No secret, okay? All the things that I said. That's here. They move to verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. This is the angel speaking. To the disciples at Mount Olivet, Jesus is taken up in the cloud. So the, the angel says, hey guys, why, why are you staying here just as if you don't know what to expect next? The way you see Jesus taken up in the cloud, that's the way he's going to come back. What that means is this. The disciples and the people of that age, that generation, were very, very unique. They came to the end of the Old Testament and they began the new. Amen. Simeon, we read from Luke chapter 1, had 
witness the coming, the first coming of Jesus. He held up the baby. This is the promised one, the salvation of Israel and also a light to the Gentiles. So there, there was his first coming, just like the angels announced to the shepherd, his first coming. But the angel here is telling the disciples he's coming again. So we then have a forecast or a prophecy that he's coming again. Just like the Old Testament people had a prophecy that he was coming. So the experience that they had, we can share that experience. How did they behave? How did they believe? What did they say concerning his first coming? And then what, the, what does the scriptures say to believers now in the New Testament about his next coming? You following me so far? We are not idle and like there's no roadmap, there's no plan. You know, you're going on a holiday to a foreign country. You don't speak the language. You have no map. You have no money. That is pathetic, right? What would you be found there? Right? What kind of tour guide did you employ? But God is not like that. Amen? From the beginning, before the foundation of the world, He already had everything mapped out. Hallelujah. Now, verse 13. This is the context of my message. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is why we know where he ascended. That was the Mount of Olives. Which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Who, who went there? There was Peter, there was James, there was John, there was Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. Not his carrot, Judas the son of James. These all continued. Say all continued. It's important. It's, it's a continuing process, right? There was a little bit of hiccup with, with the crucifixion and, and, and the resurrection. They, they had difficulty believing, but Jesus says, everybody reset, 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 reset. Everybody is in harmony now, all right, in terms of belief and so on. So on. Moving on. So they were in the upper room. This all continued, what? With one accord in prayer and supplication. And they were there with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So he had a family. Amen? In fact, James, who wrote James, was his, his brother. Now, the title of my message is One Accord in Prayer and Supplication. Can you say that with me? One Accord in Prayer in Supplication. For years and years and years, this is my honest confession, I read this over, oh yeah, they, they were in the upper room and they were in one mind and they were praying and then move on, right? But recently, and, and I must say this, um, there's this prayer and healing Zoom meetings that's, um, we're too early. The third one is June the 7th to the 9th. I think there might be a, a poster there on the notice board. If not, uh, we'll, 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 we'll stick one up. I invite all of us to participate. The times this time around, 7 to 9 of June is 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. But it's Zoom. You can be in your t-shirt and your shorts, right? Wherever you are. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I really, really want you to attend. The discussion and dialogue is between Reverend James Tan and Reverend Cindy Weber and her husband, Jeff Weber, and of course, uh, Reverend James' wife, Kenny. It's a dialogue and it's a prayer. But the discussion and the depth of the discussion and the participation and presence of the Holy Spirit is such that we bring our presence, we bring our awareness, and then there's a corporate prayer and things shift. We are looking forward not just to his coming again, that's Jesus. We're also looking forward to the next move of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are in a sense volunteering ourselves like a staging post. Amen. You know, I, 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 this may be to the men more so than the women. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I like war stories. 
you know, I, I don't like, of course, the killing and the dying and that kind of stuff, but the strategies and, and the planning and that kind of stuff, it's just a boy stuff, you know, cowboys and pistol, bang, bang, and that kind of stuff. And so there's, there's a childhood part of me that I take in into this kind of thing, there's a, there's a draw in interest. And there are parallels, some of it, concerning the kingdom of God. There were a lot of moves and counter moves, let's say, in the Second World War. Some of it was deliberate deception, so you send the enemy the wrong way. Amen. But what it does mean here is, is in order to win, there is a plan and there are staging points, there are landing points, and there are strategies to move and eventually not only send the enemy running, but to destroy him completely. Amen. So concerning the moves of the Holy Spirit, he has his strategy also. He's been very active and busy. But in, the daily, in our daily walk, we don't see it. There are no newspapers, you know. You gotta do, do you have a delivery angel and send you a newspaper in heaven that you can't read? You know, maybe it's written by magic ink. You put a little candle underneath it and to see the text, right? You know, it's not like that, right? <laughs> huh? But when you come and pray in the spirit and spend time with him, he reveals things. Amen. And this is where the encouragement is. So I'll stop there as an advertisement. One accord, prayer and supplication. When we read one accord, we turn about all, oh, church unity. And when we think about church unity, sometimes we might say, yeah, there are problems. I, 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 I know of church that are not so united. So when we talk about church unity, sometimes almost instantly the mind plays back on some troubles in church. The first shift is, look, this is what happened in the upper room. Let the Lord speak to us what He wants to tell us. Amen. Rather than corrupt the innocence of Luke's writing with the bad experiences that we have. You who believe, anyone who believe, come to me and drink from me. And if you believe in me, out of you, your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Not the water that Moses provided. That was temporary. You will have living waters. You will never run dry. Never again thirsty. You will not suffer burnout. You will have life. Amen. Hallelujah. There is nothing dirty or unclean or blockage because the river is flowing. But we must allow it to flow. It will flow from here to here. If we say nothing about his word, we never bless ourselves, neither do we bless others. We've never even quoted a scripture of any benefit to ourselves or the church or the community. Well, maybe you only have a well. Nothing is flowing. Get it to flow. Amen. Because you believe. Let that flow change your circumstance, change your perspective. So they were one accord. That means one mind. They were agreed on all things. They had a common purpose. There's a unified objective. The word given to them was none other than the Lord himself. There's only one God, one Lord. Amen. Who loves us and we love him in return. All of that consolidates into one. They're one accord. And they were in prayer. What is prayer? <laughs> prayer are words from our hearts directed to God. It's communication. It is fellowship. Amen. There are prayers of supplication and thanksgiving of joy and so on and so forth. All kinds of prayers. Because we have different needs and we have different emotions depending on what we're experiencing. Amen. There's a joy that we dance. And of course there are time, times that we are sad and we mourn. But there's still prayers. And God hears and he will then provide what he provides. Amen. So there were one accord. 
And whatever they said in their overflow, in the in, in their expressions, what the Spirit is preparing them for, they pray. And I dare say about this, the Spirit, it is before Pentecost, but in John 20, we see that when Jesus appeared to them, He what? He breathed on them. So they were born again. Say born again. They were born again believers, disciples of Jesus Christ, except they're still waiting for the experience of Pentecost. Amen. So between born again and Pentecost, they were one accord in prayer. Where? In the upper room. For how long? Ten days. Between ascension and Pentecost was ten days. For us, between this message and next week, it's only seven days. <laughs> In this one week, and they pray. Then the interesting word here is supplication. I didn't realize this. I, you know, supplication is you ask something from God, Lord. Your car is a bit old, the tire is a bit worn. God, can you please help me to get me some tires? That's a supplication. You're asking for a supply, right? Asking for a supply. The Greek word... In strong concordance, it's G1162. G1162, I hope I pronounce this correctly. Diasis or diasis. Not dialysis. Eh? Diasis. Man, it's tricky. Listen. It's a seeking and an asking, a knocking. Like Matthew 7, seek, ask not. My, my, my own insertions to help us understand it, which suggests to us that it is continuous. They were, they were there for 10, 10, 10 days, right? So they didn't just say once. It was there for a period of time. It was continuous and they were requesting from God. They were requesting from God who supplies. Amen. If they are in supplication, they are praying for things to receive from God. Am I correct? Well, can we have some ideas? What do you think they were praying for? Somebody to settle the hotel bill. They've been in upper room for quite a long time. Somebody to buy tapa for the next whatever number of days because we don't know exactly when the Holy Spirit is coming or how He is coming, right? And uh, yes, the names given there doesn't look like many, but at the end of the day, we know in Pentecost came there were 120, right? At today's cost, one tapau, what? At least six ringgit, I guess, if not seven, without drinks. Drinks, you go to the pool of Shalom, okay? Get a free drink there. So seven, seven ringgit times 120, there's what? 840 for one meal. And you being a disciple of Jesus Christ and you already witnessed the feeding of 5,000, you cannot tell each other, let's fast the next meal. No? Right, so everything will be supplied and it will be the best. Am I correct? Now, do you think in their understanding they were just concerned over the next 10 days? Would that be reasonable? Or they were praying for something much bigger? Let me give you an example. Jesus said to them, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is the commission to you. All right? Let's say the commission to you. I then ask you, what do you need to get it from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth? What do you need? Who wants a few buses? Come on. You want a bus? You need a bus? You, you, you need a van? You need van drivers and mechanics and so on and so forth? Maybe you need some tour companies. You need people, right? You need guys like Paul. You don't know who he is yet, but you need a guy like Paul to help to do the teaching, right? To get from Old Testament to New Testament. You have no idea that he will first persecute the church, but that's beside the point. You need somebody to help you teach. Am I correct? Hallelujah. What one more do you need? Oh, you need organizers. Come on, come on, come on. What else do you need? Private jets. Yeah, why not? You need some speed. Caterers. That's right. You need caterers. Hospitality. Is it? Anything else? Money. Right? Hey. He fed 5,000. He fed 4,000. 
the rest of the time, they go by faith. Amen. God will supply. And they tithe. And you get guys like, like uh, Zacchaeus turn up, right? He gives. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, gave. Barnabas sold his land, gave. Huh? Praise the Lord. So can you get the idea of the supplications? The Greek word, besides the asking part, also expresses the condition why you need to ask. It's a need. It can also have the idea of extreme poverty. One, privation where food and essentials for well-being are lacking or the absence of quality. I want to put forward to us like this. Jesus spent 40 days speaking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He sent them forth, and he has already tried it, right? He sent 12, then he sent 70, am I correct? He has already tried them out, you know? Bring nothing with you, see what happens. And if somebody accepts you, well, stay with them. You say, peace be with you. If they reject you, so excuse yourself, shake the dust off your feet and go to the next uh, place. So they have tried out and they preach the kingdom. Repeat the same message that what Jesus was saying and then lay hands on the sick and see them healed. And there's a demon. Oppression will cast the demons out in Jesus' name. So that was their field work. They have already done their testing, right? And then he gives them the Great Commission. Let's listen to the Great Commission. Shall we? I, I did this last week. You find that the four Gospels expresses the Great Commission in different ways. In Luke chapter 24, he tells them, having opened their understanding they might, that might comprehend the scriptures, he tells them that it was necessary for Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in this name, in his name, to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So he tied scriptures, the word, waiting for the spirit, and in this word is about forgiveness, repentance, remission, turning to God and remission. All right? And it's from Jerusalem onwards. So if you receive that, can you do your planning list over the next five years? What do you need? How are you going to do it? Jesus just gave the commission, right? He didn't tell them how to do it. He just told them. And of course, it's implied that his example over the last three and a half years has already told them how to do it. John 15, verse 7 to 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's a condition. Abide in him. Always have him, number one. Be very, very conscious of him and his presence in your life. Abide in him. Well, you're born again, you have his spirit in you, you can't miss that, right? But that, what that means is we've got to tune out distractions to keep him major in our life. And then it says, and my words abide in you. How do you allow his words to abide in you? You must know your scriptures. And then in your speaking, in your praying, in your believing, you are standing on the, his word. Am I correct? Whatever you want and you desire from God, find the scriptures that say so. I mean, this is a silly example, I know. But you cannot expect God to answer your prayer if you are praying for somebody else's husband to be your husband. It sounds silly, right? It sounds silly, okay? But, but you know what I mean. It totally contradicts the word of God. Am I correct? So you stand on the scriptures 
and you stand on his promises, and in his name is always yes and amen. For the glory of God to the church. When you abide in him and his words abide in you, then he says this, you will ask what you desire. He didn't say just ask what you need. Chicken rice, two pieces of chicken only. Cannot have four. This is not boarding school. Neither is it prison. Right? You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You want tie only? No wing. Okay, done. You want a bit of rose and a bit of steam? Done. Amen. You will ask. Listen to this. If you abide in me, if you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you will ask. You following that? When the two comes in contact, you will ask. It motivates you to ask. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Then verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You know the bearing fruit for, 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 for God part? It's not painful, you know, what wow, Jesus comes with snippers, you know, wow. Prune this one, uh, prune that one, a uh, naughty, did not study Bible, did not pray, prune, 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 tear your hair out. No. So long as you, are, you abide in him and his word abides in you, you will ask, he then replies you, things begin to happen, fruit begins to grow, that's what God is looking for. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that simple? And you will be my disciples. So disciples abide in him and allow his word to abide in them. And when that happens, disciples ask. Have you asked? <laughs> okay, in the asking now, by all means ask for yourself. But I want to share with us in the closing minutes, ask for others. Ask beyond yourself. I have found myself making a confession, I guess, something like that, up here. That in leading this church, I find increasingly so that I've suggested that we align with the word of faith and we consider aligning in a more formal way in terms of prayer participation and programs and so on and so forth, singling out Reverend James Tan because of synergy and, and things like that, okay? Because I feel that to the next level, to the next level, I don't have enough experience, I don't have enough understanding and so on to reach out to there. I have enough to bring us to here. And even as, I'll take for example, even as we move towards the constructions of the development of Lot 6591, the closer we get to it, the more it consumes me of my attention and my time. Details, right? Before, well, you just do a proposal, do a nice presentation, pray for it, and you just wait. Now it's going to be, it's, it's for real. How many chairs do you need? You know, you mean what? We need chairs? Yeah. You know, and, and, and the list goes, goes on. Senior citizens, daycare. What kind of lighting do they need? What kind of furniture do they need? These are all folks, right? And my friend uh, uh, who, who ministers to them, Bible study and so on and so forth, he just shared his testimony. He says, sometimes I wonder if they understand me in the Bible study because many of them are senior citizens and they suffer from various degrees of dementia. But the Lord says, you carry on ministering to them. He says, okay. But you cannot help wondering, right? This offers whether they understand him or not. And listen to this. God answered him. One day, he was buying some kueh. An old lady came forward, pulled out from her pocket something like two ringgit and some coins. 
and address him because he was Chinese, address him as pastor. Pastor, I want to pay for the kueh. This old lady. He was obviously surprised. The person attending to him sort of shoo the old lady away. I know it, know it. Okay, here he can, he can afford to, to pay. He then realized that the old lady who was trying to pay actually goes to the senior citizen daycare where he gives the Bible study lessons. And the person who is you know, at the counter is the daughter. The Lord then inspired his understanding that they do understand, they recognize who you are and they appreciate. But there's dementia in between, no doubt. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See how the Spirit of God works when we serve Him and we are open to Him and we are in tune for Him. Anyhow, um, let's quickly. I really am very grateful for the two prayer and healing Zoom sessions that I mentioned just now. Because nobody planned the topic. I didn't submit my prayer request. Could you please consider this? No, I just attended. And the Spirit of God moved and, and so on. And this last session was particularly uh, meaningful for me because, let me just recap what I just said. Jesus gave all of them the Great Commission. All right? It is worded differently in the Gospels. In Luke's one, it talks about the message of repentance and remission. In John's one, it says, um, as the Father has sent me, so I also send you. Right? In other words, no, no, no difference. Then in Matthew, of course, go and make disciples. All authority has been given. Make disciples, baptize them, and I'll be with you as you teach them. Mark's gospel talks about signs and wonders following those who believe. I mean, so there are different angles. All right? Now, how are you going to follow through with these instructions? What would be your prayer points in your supplications? Because uh, if somebody says you need a bus, well, there's no bus. You need a donkey, maybe you have to go back to the shop there, the one that Jesus wrote, whether it's still available. Besides, hey, who's paying for lunch, huh? We've been here a few weeks already, you know? Did anybody underwrite or not? And what's left in the kitty? Because Judah is already dead, right? We don't read of another treasurer taking over. What would you pray for? That comforts me. Because if God has a purpose for BM Grace, the supply is already done. Amen. Not just the physical supplies. Yes, we need an extra 10 million on top of the 20 because, 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 because. And that's a big prayer point. And do, please do pray. The supplies of the five-fold ministry, call it forth. There's only one of me, not five. Right? All of us can do something. All of us need not be doing exactly the same thing. But all of us can do something. Every one of us can pray. Amen. And allow the Spirit to pray through you. When we don't know how to pray, the Spirit of God prays. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll just co connect this little, 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 little bit and then must close. I, I mentioned in Luke chapter 2 that Simeon, an Old Testament person, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, remember, this is before he was born again, but he was devout he is a, obviously a prayerful man and the Spirit will come upon him to lead him to the temple to identify the couple with the child and say, this is the promised one. This is Israel's salvation and he will bring light to the Gentiles. Amen. If an Old Testament man not born again without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, without experience Pentecost, can experience that can you experience something better or at least the same? Amen. Hallelujah. Are we able to draw from God the understanding as we 
live in this generation, calling forth the kingdom of God to come and manifest in our presence as we look forward to his second coming, the rapture of the church. Amen. James says this in James chapter 5, verse 7 to 8. Be patient and persevering concerning his coming or second coming. Establish your hearts. Don't just drift, don't just worry, don't be aimless, don't be like the rest of the world as if there's no help, as if there's no God. Patient, persevere, establish your hearts. We must know Him and let His Word abide in us and we'll be asking for the right things and He will be happily answering all our prayers. Amen. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. When we talk about the latter rain and the former rain, we, we imagine this metaphor for the moves of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So between the last move, whether your last move is Bakalalan or Barrio, or your last move is Pentecost, it doesn't matter, there is the next one. And finally, there's one when he comes. All right? So as we prepare our hearts and wait for the Holy Spirit to do the next move, we ourselves establish our hearts with an anticipation of his move. Can we say amen to that? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. If, come to me if you are thirsty. <laughs> Let's close with this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Anybody here thirsting? Hello. <laughs> hey, you die from thirst first before you die from hunger. Right. So thirst is serious. If you're hungry, you can fast. If you're thirsty, you better drink. Especially when our very hot weather these days. If you are thirsty, come to Jesus and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Amen. That your thirst be satisfied. Hallelujah. But this is more, much more than just a physical thirst. You can go to the back, they turn on the tap. There's a cup there, you can just draw some water from the supply. All right. This is much more than physical thirst. Brothers and sisters in Christ, bless yourself. Bless your neighbor. Bless the church. One accord in prayer and supplication. Speak and pray beyond our four walls here. Amen. In anticipation of what God will do. Beyond Lot 6591, even though that's challenging enough. We have a hall that can sit easily 500. Pray for the plastic chairs. Hallelujah. Thank you. More importantly, pray for the souls who sit on the plastic chairs. Amen. It's because of this kind of challenges that I have, because I see it. Right? Scripturally, I need to search for the answers, but physically as an engineer and helping with the project, I see it before it comes. Hallelujah. And so, I, I feel overwhelmed. And so I said, look, I think I can only bring it up to here because that's kind of big, you know. And after saying that, I didn't ask Pastor James or Reverend James to do anything. Then comes this prayer and healing Zoom meetings. And so I attended. I said, hallelujah. The answer is not in my concern and therefore depending on others to help, although that's part of it. The answer then is to understand the text and allow the Spirit to come and therefore pray. Then He, He who answers exceedingly abundantly, far above what we can think or imagine, 
That's our God who answers. So the invitation is for us to do exactly that. Imagine, think, ask. Amen. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember, I hear the Spirit of God saying, do not be a spectator. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be a participant. Hallelujah. And not just a participant in a distance. But let it become real. When you read that the where the water goes, it brings life. That's good. Hallelujah. But out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You are the life that the river has given. Amen. It means you. Hallelujah. It's not you doing some zoology, but it is you receiving his life. In Jesus' name. Amen.